Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and we can hear Jerry clear as a bell. So she's here with us. And this, of course, is Stuff You Should Know. True crime. Yeah. I was about to say sort of, but no, it, it really is. is true crime. It's just, uh, it's not necessarily murdery. No, but it's stalky, and I, I hadn't really realized it until I saw it spelled out a few times, that this is a huge stalking case, one of the weirdest, creepiest, most mysterious stalking cases of all time. Yeah, but I think I know who did it. Let's hold it. <laughs> Wait. Save it. Because we'll definitely have that combo, okay? Yeah, I think this is one of those. It's, uh, what is it, Occam's Razor? Is that the mm-hmm. the most obvious thing? We did an and, episode on that, remember? Yeah, yeah, a gazillion years ago. But this, I think this is one of those where it is a lot less uh, mysterious when you kind of just look at it at its face. Right. So in it's other words, you think the cat did it? The cat did do it, always. <laughs> so we're talking about this mystery, um, usually called in its full title, The Circleville, Ohio Poison Pen Letters. And it is a weird, unsolved mystery case. In fact, it, be- it came into the, the widest um, public awareness thanks to that TV show, Unsolved Mysteries, back in the early 90s. Yeah, they loved it. And um, a lot of their info was based on this journalist and private investigator named Martin Yant, who'd already been investigating it by then. But it is a really weird, odd true crime mystery. And yes, it is true crime, even though you're right. It doesn't have murder involved. There's no serial killer or anything like that. But it is bizarre and it is weird and it is still unsolved to this day. Yeah, there's a death. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not a murder, though. I don't want to ruin it. So before we get too far into it, I want to give some shout outs to some of the sources for this one. Unsolved Mysteries, their website, uh, a couple of CBS websites, Mental Floss, Thought Mm -hmm. Catalog, Historic Mysteries, List First had some good stuff, and then True Crimes Times um, had some good stuff. And then also there were a couple of podcast sites um, that have already covered this, that if this sure. floats your boat, go check out the Whatever Remains podcast um, coverage of this. And there's also one called Invisible Ships podcast that covered this too. And we um, use some of their info from their sites too. Yeah, and this is one of those... Um it's a little frustrating to research because there's uh, a lot of different conflicting information, mm-hmm. and it's kind of hard to get to the real facts. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of it's not the biggest deal. It's just like, oh, well, I saw that this was this. And, I mean, right off the bat, for instance, mm-hmm. in Circleville, Ohio, these uh, mystery letters started coming to Mary Gillespie, mm-hmm. Gillespie. Mm-hmm. But then I saw sites that say, oh, no, the superintendent received letters before Mary Gillespie even. Is that right? Yeah, so who knows? Uh, it doesn't really damage the the main storyline. Mm-hmm. Like, nothing contradicts it such to where I was like, well, I don't even know what I've just read then. <laughs> right, I don't even know what's true anymore. But all this just is a way of setting up, like, if there are things that are slightly off, it's because it's just hard to get the real you know, like we didn't have the case file in front of us. So most of the coverage of this mystery does start with Mary Gillespie f- receiving her first letter. And Mary Gillespie was a local bus driver in Circleville, Ohio. And Circleville, Ohio is a tiny little town about 20, 25 miles south of Columbus, Ohio, the capital of Ohio. A school um, bus driver, by the way, which is very key. Yes, thank you for that. Um, And so this is a small town, and Mary Gillespie was a small town person who just kind of typically minded her own business, was, from what I could tell, generally well thought of, if she was ever thought of at all by other people. Um, And she got this first letter, and it was written in this kind of weird, blocky handwriting. And it was a rather alarming letter um, for anybody to get, because it basically said, I know that you're having an affair with the uh, superintendent of the West Falls School District, which you're an employee of. And if you don't stop, bad things are going to start happening to you. Right. Uh, his name was Gordon Massey. Said they were watching her. The, the, uh, the superintendent was Gordon Massey that she was having an affair with, right? Yes. Okay. As opposed you. to who? The letter writer. <laughs> <laughs> 
it would be no mystery if we knew the letter writer. Hey, if I were listening to this podcast, <laughs> I would have been confused just then. So I was looking out for that version of me that's out there listening. Oh, goodness. I hope that person isn't listening. Uh, so they said that they were watching it and, and, quote, this is no joke. So these letters start coming in. Uh, almost all of them had that same blocky letter, meaning basically capital letters. Mm -hmm. Uh, some did not though, and we'll get into that a little bit more later, mm -hmm. but the lion's share of them had this one kind of writing style that was very signature, clearly kind of written by the same person. Yeah. And so Mary, you know, she hides these letters for a little while, obviously didn't even tell her husband at first, and then eventually says, Ron, and there are a bunch of just norm core names in here, so it might get a little confusing <laughs> <laughs> with like the Rons and the Marys and the Pauls. Uh, -huh. uh, but she told her husband, Ron, she said, listen, I've been getting these letters and th here's what they say. And the letters are saying that I need to tell the school board about this mm -hmm. or they will out me basically on, you know, how you would out someone in the 70s, which is on the Radio CB uh, by putting up billboards and signs. Uh, this would be your modern like social media threat, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. And so Ron uh, said, well, I think Mary said, listen, I think I know these are coming from this other guy, uh, David. He's another uh, school bus driver, David Longberry. And he, mm -hmm. he tried to come on to me and I rebuffed him. And I think that's who's writing these. So, and uh, from what I could tell, Mary kept the letters to herself until Ron started getting letters himself that basically said, your wife is having an affair with Gordon Massey and you better make him stop or else I'm going to tell everybody. And so that's when she turned to, to Dave and was like, oh, yeah, I, I forgot to tell you about these letters and that I've been accused of having an affair. I'm totally not having an affair, though, but what are we going to do about these letters, huh? So they loop in, uh, as you would do, some family members. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron's sister, Karen, who will become a key player, and her husband, Paul, uh, Fresh Hour was their last name, married last name. He would become a, a key player. Uh, he was a prison guard and not... Uh, just a little side factoid about him is the the prison movie Brubaker with Robert Redford. Mm -hmm. He was in that movie. He was a, a they filmed it nearby, and he was cast as an extra as a prison guard because he was a real prison guard. He was a real prison guard. And another fun fact about Paul Freshour is in the late sixties at the prison he was a guard at. Um, it was overrun by an inmate riot, and he was held prisoner for like thirty hours by the inmates. Well, he was a natural for Brubaker then. He was. So um, by the time these letters started coming through, he was no longer a prison guard. He was a quality inspector at the local Anheuser-Busch bottling plant. But I took from the fact that he was a former prison guard that they they, they wanted to get some muscle involved, and they, they went to him to ask him to write the letters. That was that was how I took it. Yeah, and he, he worked, and this kind of becomes key later on, he worked uh, about 50 to 60 hours a week mm -hmm. and had a pretty decent commute to and from. So uh, the long and short of that is is he was gone at work a lot of the time. Right. So Paul said, okay, of course, I'll, I'll help you guys out. And he sent a letter, at least one, to David Longberry, the other bus driver that had made advances on Mary and who they suspected was the writer of these letters and said, hey, Buster, we know what you're doing. You better stop. Uh, if you don't, bad things are going to happen to you. So c cool off, essentially. I'm paraphrasing here in a 70s kind of way. And um, it, it seemed like it worked because for a few weeks, the letters that had been starting to come like hard and fast just dried up at first. Yeah, because he said, stop what you're doing because I'm about to ruin. Mm -hmm. Go on. What, what The image and the style that you're used to. That's right. And who wouldn't stop writing letters with if received with uh, that threat? Yeah, because they thought they they had this anonymous letter writer, you know, dead to rights, and he was going to going to be scared off now. Because ultimately, if it was this guy who, from like Ron Gillespie's point of view, what he was being told by his wife that she wasn't having an affair, this guy was making this up because she had resisted his advances. If you if you tell somebody, look, stop, we know that you're doing this, of course they're going to stop, the jig is up. So they did think that it had handled it, especially when those letters dried up for a few weeks. But um, not too long after that, they uh, were rather dismayed because um, rather than just letters, now there were signs being posted around town that were saying essentially the same thing. Yeah, they were saying not only that, but they were saying that Gordon Massey 
superintendent, not letter writer, mm-hmm. was uh, <laughs> involved romantically with the Gillespie's 12-year-old daughter, Tracy. Right. So, of course, dad sees this. Ron starts driving around, tearing these signs down, mm-hmm. you know, before the break of dawn so no one would see these things. And this just sort of went on for a while. There were these letters that would come and go. I think about a uh, a little more than a year went by. Uh, and in August of 77, Mary's like, I got to get out of here. I'm going to go to Florida with uh, with your with my sister-in-law, with your sister Karen, uh-huh. and a couple of other friends. Uh, later on, people said that was a cover-up for maybe going down to meet Gordon Massey in Florida. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's true. I think she went down with her friends. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you think that's true? Mm-hmm. I think we might have different uh, people in mind on who did this. In. Okay. We'll get to that, though. Okay. That'll be the exciting reveal at the end. I can't wait, man. <laughs> so, uh, it Ron... It was Gordon Massey, the letter writer. <laughs> Back at home, Ron answers the phone. Uh, it was a person claiming to be the letter writer on the other end. He said that he recognized the voice. He got mad. He got his gun and tells the kids, I'm going to take care of this problem once and for all. Mm-hmm. And a few hours later, Ron is dead. Dead. D-E-A-D, but he wasn't dead, like, from a stab wound or no one had broken his neck or anything like that. He was dead from a car accident. He had run into, I believe, a tree. He'd run off the road, driven about 30 feet at a high speed and run into a tree. It it was the 70s, so he very well might not have even had a seatbelt installed in his car, but at the very least, he didn't have it on. Yeah, it was a pickup truck. He was half thrown from the cab, which is grisly. Um, and he died at the site. Like, he wasn't pronounced dead at the hospital or on the way to the hospital. They pronounced him dead on the site. He was super dead of massive internal injuries. And so there were a couple of really fishy things about all this. Number one, the intersection where he died at, it was not far from his house. So he knew this intersection very well. The weather was fine. It was nighttime, but it wasn't like raining out or anything like that. And he, his gun had was found to have had one um, round missing and it had been fired. It wasn't just missing. Like the gun had been fired and no shell casing was found. So in between the time that he stormed out of his house to apparently confront the letter writer and the time he was found dead, he had discharged his gun and they had no idea at whom, where it was discharged, um, under what circumstances. They just knew that he had shot his gun once. Oh, so it was not a revolver. Not that I know of, because they I've seen multiple places that they did not find a shell casing. So it sounds like it was an automatic or semi-automatic. All right. Uh, so that, uh, some people might say, is fishy. The other thing that other people say is fishy, I don't find any of this fishy, by the way, mm-hmm. is that he was, uh, they ruled it a, a, a drunken driving accident. Uh, other people, friends would say, like, he, Ron didn't even drink that much. Uh, we didn't see him drinking that day. But you can't argue with science, and he had twice the legal limit of uh, and his blood alcohol content. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think any of this is fishy. I think he drank up some courage to go confront someone and wrecked his car and died. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something that, that gets left out of this is like this was a really dark period in Ron um, Gillespie's wi- life. Like he was driving around for hours before work every day finding these signs – Oh, at yeah. the very least, looking for him if, like, he couldn't find him. Like, he didn't sleep very well. It makes a lot of sense that he would have taken up drinking uh, when he was otherwise a teetotaler. He was being told by this person that his wife was having an affair, even though she swore that she wasn't. It was a bad time for him. So he he had, a, like, a really rough last year or so of his life, and then he died badly as well, too. It was not a good end for Ron Gillespie. Um, and... There was a, a bit of a scandal after that because apparently Paul Freshour said that he suspected it was foul play and that the sheriff on the case, basically the, the local law enforcement guy who would see this case through the entire its entirety, was a guy named Dwight Radcliffe. He was the sheriff. And um, Paul Freshour claims that at first Sheriff Radcliffe agreed with him that it seemed like there was something fishy and that foul play might have been involved. But then after that, he suddenly changes his story, Sheriff Radcliffe does. And uh, like you said, it gets ruled an accident, especially after the coroner comes back with a 0.16 blood alcohol content for Ron Gillespie. That's right. Uh, And Radcliffe said there was initially some kind of suspect that, and I know you did too, looked high and low 
I don't think it's literally ever been released who Sheriff Radcliffe Mm -hmm. initially had in for questioning. Mm -hmm. Uh, But apparently this person even went so far as to take a polygraph test Mm -hmm. and uh, got away with it. I don't I don't know if it was one of the uh, who knows. I don't know if it's any of the key suspects that we'll talk about later or not. uh, And I don't think we'll ever know who that was. But uh, there was a suspect and that was sort of dismissed out of hand once the DUI. Uh, alcohol reading came back and the polygraph test was passed. Yeah, the the one person I saw floated as potentially who it was was David Longberry, that bus driver. Who, well, that's who I figured. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's never been documented. I'm not even positive that it's documented that Sheriff Radcliffe actually did any of this, like a polygraph and all that stuff. Well, he said he did. So Ron is dead, Chuck. The the Circleville letter writer has claimed a life, a human life has been snuffed out that otherwise probably wouldn't have been had the Circleville letter writer not started writing this terrible letter campaign. That's right. You want to take a break and pick back up afterward? Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Ron's gone, and it's about the same time that, uh, you know, Karen and Paul are having a rough go of it as well. Uh, And I just, the feeling I got was they didn't have a great marriage. It wasn't because of the Circleville stuff. Mm -hmm. But they began to divorce, and uh, Karen had cheated on him. Karen is, uh, you know, she didn't get the house, she didn't get the kids. And ended up living on a in, in a trailer on Mary's property uh, after Ron was gone, and this was like Karen was not a <laughs> she didn't take any of this well. Right. Everything I saw was that Karen was uh, lived in a constant state of upset and anger at Paul because of this divorce, even though she was the one that cheated. Right. Um, so. Just just put that in your hat. Like, put yeah. a pin in that and save it for later. <laughs> put it in your hat. <laughs> and smoke it, right? Uh-huh. So, one of the things that came out of this um, this close contact where Karen was living on a trailer in Mary's property is that supposedly during this time, after Ron died, Mary admitted that she actually was having an affair with Gordon Massey. But, 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 don't judge her too harshly yet because it didn't start until after the letter writing campaign started. The letters were BS all along. You know what I think? (laughs) What? I think she had had an affair with him before and stopped and then started back up. Okay, that's possible. That's my feeling. I think she had an affair with him. Maybe it was off and on. Who knows? Maybe it was pretty much constant. And then at some point, um, Gordon Massey left his wife or his wife left him. I got the impression his wife might have left him and that Mary was not necessarily his only fling, his only mistress. And that um, after that and after Ron died she felt comfortable saying that they were having an affair, um, but it started after the letter writing campaign. That's my take on it. Well, supposedly the superintendent had, uh, I don't know if it was verified or not, but was accused of having affairs with quite a few of the female bus drivers. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, not just Mary. No, but I mean specifically bus drivers. I got you. Okay. Yeah, I think the the Circleville letter writer basically intimated that or outright said it in in some of the letters, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, So, okay. So, Gordon— I just think it's interesting that he has the thing for bus drivers is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it is. It is a real thing, isn't it? I guess so. Those yellow buses, he can't can't turn them down. Maybe so. Um, So, okay. So, we've got Mary admitting that she is having or has had an affair— with Gordon Massey. Um, Ron's dead. Paul and Karen are splitting up. And we start to reach into the 1980s. And not only were the signs continuing, the letters were continuing, the postcards were continuing. People um, who were who had nothing to do with, like, Mary or Karen or Paul um, or Gordon had were getting letters. Like, the businesses were getting letters. I saw one that was addressed to a barber shop, And it... it it said, Dear Public, and then it went into this tirade about Gordon and Mary. So, 
a lot of people were getting letters in this town about this stuff. Um, and then things kind of stepped up tremendously in February of 1983. Yeah, and by the way, I think all of these letters were still being postmarked from Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. And that's uh, that's kind of a key detail that um, that we can't overlook, is that they're all being mailed, and Columbus is what, like half hour away or so? Something like that, yeah. Okay. So, uh, like they weren't being mailed from that town. Right. Uh, so Mary is uh, doing her job. She's still a bus driver six years later. Mm-hmm. Despite all this stuff, she's still taking those kids to school. Bless her heart. And she sees a sign on her route that uh, I have seen, and this is one of those dumb details. I've seen it was on a post. I've seen it was attached to a fence. Mm-hmm. But either way, there was a sign that had uh, incriminating stuff about her once again. It threatened the life of her daughter, which was a big one. So this is one she actually got out to to take down. And she she took down the whole thing because it was kind of an odd looking setup. And what she realized when she got home was that it was a booby trapped sign that had a, a gun, a twenty five caliber handgun, and a little container that allegedly was supposed to go off if someone were to come by and kind of yank that sign down uh, without much care. Yeah, like I think maybe some string was connected to the back of the sign and, and it went to the trigger maybe or something like that, but it was designed to elicit an angry response. And apparently she didn't take it down in anger and it saved her life. But That's there's right. a, there's a gun now. There's a, So Ron died probably from his own, you know, um, accidental driving. This is totally different. This is attempted murder. Um, and it, it's like, this is a, like an entirely new ball game. This isn't just like, you know, harassing somebody or stalking somebody. This now is attempted murder. There's a loaded gun that was set up to go off on, on Mary. So, of course, the, the police get a hold of this gun, and they see pretty quickly that somebody's attempted to, to file the serial number off of it. But they haven't done a very good job of it. And they hand it over to the uh, Bureau of Criminal Investigation, the state investigators, and they say, oh, yeah, this is easy. W- uh, watch this. And they get a piece of blank paper and a nice crayon, and they rub it over it. And sure enough, there is the serial number that wasn't properly filed down, and they can now trace the gun. That's right. And they traced it back to a guy who worked at Anheuser, uh, Anheuser-Busch, and he said, uh, you know what? That was my gun, but I sold it for 35 bucks to mm-hmm. Paul Freshour, yep. my, co- my co-worker. Um, I guess we'll sort of reveal what we think as we go since we're doing that. I don't think that sign was supposed to go off and kill anyone. Hmm. I think it was a a f- f- rigged booby trap, like a fake mm-hmm. booby trap. I know who you think it was. All right. I know who you Let's think it was. Hold on to that. Put a pin in your hat. So Paul Freshour, the guy who was Mary and Ron's brother-in-law, Karen's ex-husband, his gun has now been found in a booby-trapped sign from the Circleville letter writer. That is a big deal. And so the police start asking Paul some questions like, why, why is your gun in a booby trap that was attached to a sign from the Circleville letter writer? And Paul says, hey, man, I have no idea. Anybody could have put that there. That gun was stolen a long time ago. And they say, well, Paul, did you report this to our local sheriff's department? And Paul says, no, I never got around to it. And they say, Paul, you should probably come downtown with us. That's right. And he went downtown with Sheriff Radcliffe. And the sheriff said, hey, I've seen a few cop TV shows in my day. <laughs> right. Uh, I've seen McLeod. <laughs> so let's let's uh, let's get a handwriting test going. And he was like, well, okay, where's your forensic uh, expert? And he goes, oh, we don't have one. So like I said, I've seen TV. So I'm going to make up some of my own tests. And I'm going to tell you to write some of this stuff. I'm going to tell you to copy these letters. I'm going to read some of them to you. Tell, and you need to write down what I'm saying. Uh, and that's going to be the proof. Um, and that's basically what happened. He was, he basically said, you know what? I, it looks like a match to me at least. <laughs> Pretty much. And, and so I'm going to arrest you on charges of attempted murder. And he was released on bond and interestingly checked himself into a uh, mental health center to get, uh, like proactively to get examined because I think at first he thought about using a reason of insanity plea mm-hmm. and wanted to, I guess, support that. Lay some groundwork. Yeah, but he he got out of that. He changed his mind later on. 
Yeah. So um, one other thing that I think pushed Sheriff Radcliffe into arresting Paul, in addition to that janky handwriting test, was um, Karen Freshour, Paul's estranged wife, Mm -hmm. during an interview told the sheriff, not only do I think that Paul is the Circleville letter writer, I actually found letters before hidden in our house addressed to other people in that same weird handwriting. Um, and Sheriff said, did you keep these letters? Can I see them? And she's like, no, I didn't keep them. You know, I don't like clutter or whatever. Um, but that definitely helped push the sheriff into into arresting Paul. So before Paul knows it, he's on trial in October of 1983 for attempted murder because of that booby-trapped gun. And at the trial, one of the things that really sunk him was that they allowed the letters to be introduced, not in any kind of, like, criminal capacity, like he wasn't charged with harassment or stalking or anything like that. They just basically used it to paint him as a weirdo and a harassing crackpot and that the letters gave some sort of roundabout motive or at least suggested that he was the person who... um, who booby-trapped that sign because the letters were connected to the sign, were connected to the gun, were connected to Paul Freshour. And without the letters, it was just the gun and Paul Freshour. So it was a huge coup for the prosecutors to be able to introduce that, um, that, those letters. And then the handwriting analyst took over, right? Yeah, the handwriting analyst confirmed, uh, two of them, that they at least believed. And, you know, we, I think we did a full episode on that, didn't we? Mm-hmm on handwriting analysis, Mm -hmm. uh, that he wrote those. Uh, The other bad thing that he had going against him was that he had taken the day off of work, uh, the day that the booby trap sign was discovered. A little bit fishy for someone who works so much, or at the very least, if he was innocent, which I think, uh, very bad luck for him that he had happened to take that day off of work. Yeah, it is very coincidental, don't you think? Well, sure. Okay. You know, of course. You can't say it's not a coincidence. Right. Uh, but he either took the day off to do the booby trap or just, it was just a bad coincidence. Um, wait, wait, you just said you can't say it's coincidence. I'll tell you, I'm not, I'll, no, no, we'll no. Just, just, I said, just, you, <laughs> I said, you can, you can, you have to say it's coincidence. Okay. Unless he did it. Okay. I gotcha. I gotcha. I see what you I saying. don't think he did it. All right. I think there's a third, there's a third alternative that we'll okay. talk about later. All right. <laughs> it's all building. I'm so excited, exciting. man. Uh, so he said in court, like, Hey, listen, this sheriff gave me this test. He told me to copy the letters <laughs> and, and I just took that to mean to try and imitate the writing. Mm-hmm. And, and none of this was even above board. He's like, he's no letter writing expert. He shouldn't have been conducting this junk science test. Yeah. And here was some other th- interesting tidbit. Uh, Mary said that, uh, Hey, listen, another bus driver said that she went past that intersection where that uh, sign was booby trapped earlier that day. And there was a dude there who did not look like uh, Paul at all. Mm -hmm. And there was an El Camino there, yellow yellow El Camino. And Paul doesn't drive that. And so like, I don't think it's him because look, I mean, look, look, look what's going on here. He's getting railroaded by the supposed handwriting and the fact that it was his gun. And that's really just circumstantial evidence. So not only was it fishy that there was a a strange man spotted 20 minutes before um, Mary found this booby trap sign at the very spot, the booby trap sign was put up. But also Chuck, it turns out that um, if you see there's a, um, there was a suspect, a possible suspect who, um, whose brother had a yellow El Camino and that person turned out to be Karen Freshour. Yeah, I see. I saw other places it was not a brother. Oh, a boyfriend? I saw that too. Well, no, it was another relative who had the El Camino Mm -hmm. because the brother would have been uh, Roy's. I mean, I guess you could have two brothers, right? Yes, and a brother or a relative could have been a boyfriend too. We're talking about Central Ohio. (laughs) What I think, and this uh, is furthering my case here a little bit, is because this guy, I don't think we mentioned when he was – when the school bus went by, he apparently like turned around real quick and acted like he was peeing or something <laughs> to to not be identified. I think that that was Karen's boyfriend mm-hmm. driving her relatives uh, El Camino. Oh, gotcha. Okay, okay, okay. I like where like, you're going you know, with that, though. Throw him off the case or whatever. I got gotcha. Sniff him off the case. Sniff him off the case. That's right. So that was never introduced, right? 
No, not in court, I don't think, right? Yeah. So the fact that that wasn't introduced, the fact that they had Paul's gun, they introduced the letters, his coworker at Anheuser-Busch said, yeah, I sold him the gun. The personnel records at Anheuser-Busch said he wasn't there that day. The, the jury took two and a half hours and came back with a guilty plea. And Paul Freshour, who may not have ever written one of these letters or booby-trapped this, this gun or this sign. He had no motive. That's another one, too which we'll talk about in a second. He was he was sentenced to 7 to 25 years in an Ohio state prison for uh, attempted murder in in uh, 1983 he was convicted and sentenced. That's right. And he remained there for many years. He was denied. I mean, he was a great prisoner when that 7 years came up. He was eligible for parole in 1990. And these letters kept coming while he was in jail, Yeah. even though there's no way that he could have written these and had them postmarked from Columbus from Mm -hmm. prison. Mm -hmm. He was even put in solitary for a while because they said these letters are coming. And they clearly weren't coming from him, but that was still the fact that they were still coming at his parole hearing. They said, no, these letters are still (laughs) coming, so we're going to keep you in here. Imagine that. Imagine being like, I'm innocent, and somebody else out there is proving that I'm innocent because these letters are still coming, but your taking is that somehow I'm doing this still. He got a letter in prison. Yeah, so you're going to keep me in. And then after he was denied parole, that first time he was up for it, after seven years in prison, he got a letter from the Circleville um, letter writer saying, now, when are you going to believe you aren't going to get out of there? I told you two years ago, when we set them up, they stay set up. Don't you listen at all? So we got a taunting letter after he was denied parole because the letters were still going on. Yeah, I wonder who wrote that. So uh, he finally did get out in 1994 after 11 years in prison, 10 to 11 years in prison for attempted murder. And he set up a website, and this was like the mid '90s, so that was like a big deal. Netscape, but he uh, probably or Crystal Links or something. <laughs> uh-huh. But he set up a website that was dedicated to this case, and you know, pro- professing his innocence and everything. Um, and you said something uh, that that I, w- I want to circle back to, and that was motive. And that is he just he didn't really have one. No, that is something that everyone has struggled with, even like the prosecutors couldn't quite say why he would have done this, that it doesn't make any sense, that there's really nothing. He didn't have anything to gain from Mary uh, being found out or whether she had an affair or not. He had nothing to gain from her dying if he if he set up that booby trap. Um, and, it, yeah, it just didn't make any sense. And when you have, like, you have motive, opportunity, and means. And he had opportunity and he had means, but he never had motive. And that was a really big deal. And the fact is he had a really good alibi despite all of that um, for almost all of the day. Um, and yet he was still convicted and spent more than 10 years in prison for it. Very sad. Uh, we should also mention that there was a letter sent not only to Paul in prison, but uh, while he was still in jail, there was a letter sent to Unsolved Mysteries, the TV show. That's right. And they were doing a segment about it, and uh, it said, Forget Circleville, Ohio. Do nothing to hurt Sheriff Radcliffe. If you come to Ohio, you L sickos will pay. <laughs> signed, the Circleville writer. Uh-huh. So I, believe, I don't know if that's the first time it was signed as such. Mm. Uh, so, well, we'll get, we'll get to it. Some of the letters are signed W. Mm-hmm over the years, and those are the ones that weren't written quite in that blocky style. But, but that, that'll, that'll come back. That letter demonstrates something that's really um, uh, characteristic of the Circleville letters, and that the almost the only punctuation in them are colons. Not semicolons, <laughs> not yeah. periods, not even ellipses. You know that annoying thing that people do where rather than commas or periods, they just use ellipses and sometimes like multiple ellipses at once? This yeah. people, this person used colons like that. So, like in a in a single letter, there could be scores of colons just just littering the the letter. <laughs> and they did this in this in this um this letter to Unsolved Mysteries as well, which I just I, that's just you don't see people doing that with colons. So I feel like that suggests that every single letter that used colons was definitely written by the same person. The only issue I will take with any of that is that I like to use the ellipsis. I've never seen you once use ellipses. I may not have used them with you. Oh, okay. Wow, that's but, it's like a, you're a whole different person <laughs> that I never knew before. Yeah, I like ellipses. I think it'd be very. I think it says a lot. It can be a very effective tool. Uh, 
And I like it. I don't, okay. I don't do like eight dots in a row. I use like the, the standard three. Okay, no, I know what you mean. So you're using it as a device to basically say, just pause and think about what I just said or wait for it. Yeah, or the ball's it. in your court or yeah, something like that. Okay, that's not at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about using an ellipse rather where a comma should be, where a period should be, where even a hyphen should be. Using an ellipse for that is it's ear bleedingly bad to read. Yeah, my mom does that. Okay. Well, I'm, I don't mean to insult you or your family. <laughs> no, no, no. I know you don't. It's, 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 uh, it's definitely weird. And it's a thing because it's not just one. My mom will put like eight <laughs> or nine dots in between phrases and sentences and emails. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, I'm not sure what that is. And if you were it in the room while she was typing it, each dot would be like, a, um, um, <laughs> um, what am I going to say next? All right. Well, let's take our final break here. Okay. And we will uh, talk a little bit more about these darn letters right after this. <laughs> Okay, so one thing about this mystery, Chuck, is it would be, like, remarkable and noteworthy— even if it were just limited to Mary and her family receiving these threatening letters and there being some signs. Hundreds and, and hundreds. Yeah, that's not at all what it was like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I saw more than a thousand letters in multiple places. More than a thousand letters, postcards, and signs were mailed or put up around Circleville and even central Ohio in general over the years. And... Um, and it, the whole letter writing campaign lasted for almost 20 years, more than 18 years of these letters. And they were, they alleged everything from murder to affairs to um, complaints about the Ohio, Ohio politics. Um, they just were all over the place. So it, it's a really weird case, even more so than like the core case that we're talking about. It's even stranger and more rambling than that. Yeah. And, you know, they were, like you said, they expanded far beyond the the Gillespie family. Mm-hmm. Uh, some accused the sheriff of being um, involved in a cover up about Ron's death. Right. Some were about just other noteworthy people in town, or not noteworthy people who just uh, you know you had an affair with this person, and you're the local doctor, or you're the local county coroner. Right. Um, you've <clears> been <throat> abusing children, and I'll, the weird thing is, is a lot of this stuff was actually true. Right. So it was like, is someone just really attentive and exposing these things? Like, what's going on there? Yeah, and I think the town lived a bit in a bit of a state of fear that, like, they were going to get targeted next and all of their sure. worst secrets were going to come out. Because, like you said, the county coroner, a guy named Dr. Ray Carroll, he apparently had previously been accused of um, inappropriate uh, contact with children. and In, uh, in a letter, right? No, in general. Oh, okay. But most people didn't know about this. It was like a secret from his past. And this letter writer brought this up. Uh, And years later, um, he actually, I think he may have lost his medical license. Um, The state medical board charged him with eight counts of gross immorality, including stuff that involved children, in 1993. So this letter writer seemed to be correct about that. There's another one that they were never proven correct about that was just maybe the most scandalous accusation they ever made. And it was directed at the prosecutor in Paul Freshour's case, a guy named Roger Klein. Yeah, they said that, um, I know you killed that woman who was pregnant. She was a school teacher. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to dig up their body and mail the bones to the cops unless you admit it. And I think this was never sort of went anywhere, right? It was just one of those accusations. No, and Roger Klein ended up continuing along the career path up to being an appeals court judge when he retired a few years back. Um, but the accusation was that he was having an affair with a school teacher, got her pregnant, and then killed her and, by proxy, her their their unborn child. Um, and the, there was a school teacher named Vicki Koch who was murdered and whose murder was never solved. Um, and I, I've seen in a couple places that Roger Klein was proven to have had an affair with her, but I could not find that, like, roundly um, proven. The upshot of all of this is this was exposed in one of the letters. So the coroner in Ron Gillespie's death is exposed in the letter and targeted. Roger Klein, the prosecutor in Paul Freshour's case, 
gets a letter of his own, and he's targeted. So it wasn't just Mary and her affair with Gordon Massey that was the full subject of these letters. Other people were targeted as well. That's right. So there's a couple of more people we should mention, I guess, before we get to our final verdicts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and they were both children of uh, key players. One was um, William Massey. This is Superintendent Massey's son. He was, uh, I've mentioned some of those earlier letters were written in a kind of different style of handwriting, and they were signed with a W. Some people say it could have been William Massey writing these and actually signing them. He was a grade school, I'm sorry, I think high school student at the time. Mm -hmm. Teenager. Yeah. And uh, so just throwing that out there. And then there is uh, Mark Freshour, who was uh, Karen and Sue's son, who, um, who went with... You know, he, he the dad got custody, so I'm not sure what kind of say they had, but I know that Mark did not go see his dad in prison one time right. and generally is sort of believed to have been on mom's side through all this. Yeah, so I'm glad you lined those up because like an Agatha Christie um, book, we're just basically introducing <laughs> characters who are now suspects at the very end of this whole thing. Yeah, and interestingly, Mark uh, in September 2002 was found dead from a uh, self-inflicted gunshot wound right. floating in a river. So uh, some people say that this was guilt uh, because he was a part of this thing. His mom, Karen, said no. He had been battling depression. Nothing to see here. So let's talk about the person that that brings up then. Um, that That is related, Mark Freshour, having to do with with the the case against his father, is everyone says that he, if he did this, it was at the behest of his mother, Karen, um, Mark, um, uh, Paul's ex-wife, and that it was Karen who was actually the Circleville letter writer, um, and who was, who basically used this whole campaign to set her ex-husband, Paul, up, right? Well, what do you think? Are you getting into what you think? No, I'm just going over one of the suspects. Okay. <laughs> What do you think? Well, here's what I think, if that's where we are. Sure. All right. I mean, we have other suspects to talk about, but sure. Well, it'll all come out in this. Okay. And I think that the original letter was sent, in fact, by David Longberry, the bus driver who Mary Gillespie uh, refuted. Mm -hmm. And I think he got jealous. I think he wrote quite a few of those first letters because they are all about other bus drivers and they are all about the school system and it's a lot of inside baseball knowledge. Okay. I mean, he wrote the first one. Okay. Then I think Karen used that uh, skin to uh, start writing letters of her own mm-hmm. when she became obsessed with getting back at her husband, uh, soon to be ex husband. And I think she did enlist her son, Mark. I think she enlisted her ex boyfriend, mm-hmm. or I'm sorry, her boyfriend. Uh, who said, you know, supposedly matched the description of the guy in the El Camino. I think that it was all her. Uh, the That Martin Yant guy, the investigator, said, in my 22 years as a journalist, I've never, I don't think I've ever met an individual so consumed with so much irrational hatred for another and a willingness to say anything, no matter how provably false, to defame him right. about her ex-husband. And I think it was all her... And then I think all these other weird letters, I think people of or of, of Ohio just started writing these right. as, as ways to expose people. Okay, okay. That's what I think. Like you said, that's Martin Yant's take on it. He knows probably more than anybody about this case aside from Paul Freshour, who, by Is the way— Is that who he thinks did it? Yeah, he thinks okay. that it started out as David Longberry and was followed up by Karen Freshour to set up Did not Paul. know that. Yeah, yeah, that was Martin Yant's theory. So you're in good well, company. Well, that's Chuck's theory. You're in good company. You <laughs> and Martin Yant agree on that. Um, and, I mean, there is a lot to, to base it on. Like, Karen and or her son um, had access to Paul's gun. Um, she had the, so that she had the means, the opportunity, and the motive for sure. She definitely hated Paul Freshour. She um, just happened to throw away all those other letters that right. she had found, supposedly. Yeah, I think even if she wasn't the letter writer, at the very least, she was doing what she could to set Paul up or make sure Paul went to jail for this, even if she hadn't gone to the trouble of being been the letter writer, okay? And my final piece is she didn't come out with any of this stuff until after that divorce was started. Right, yeah. 
Like that all, all would have come out during the divorce proceedings because it was bitter and acrimonious. So she would have used anything she could have against him. So the fact that she didn't mention those those things during the divorce proceedings is extra fishy. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. She did mention them. I'm saying none of this was mentioned. Like this whole time these letters were going on, mm -hmm. none of it was mentioned until she started to get divorced. Okay. That's not what I saw. I saw she didn't mention it until Paul was starting to be railroaded toward prison. And the fact that she didn't talk about it during the divorce proceedings made it fishy. Mm, now, see, I saw the other way is that she conveniently didn't mention any of this stuff until the divorce started to get ugly. I got you. And then all the, or not mentioned it, but that's when, that's when she got involved, I think. I got you. Okay. All right. So do you want to know who, I think there's a really good chance that what you just said is correct. I think it's entirely possible. I want to hear your take. I think it's also just as possible that the Circleville letter writer was Paul Freshour. Mm. And here's why. He, um, I saw that a motive for him to write these initial letters, some, someone's floated, I don't remember who, that it was, he was loyal to his wife at the time. And that his wife was the sister of Ron, who was being hurt by his wife, Mary, having an affair. So it's possible, whether it was his own idea or with Karen, um, he would have written these letters as a weird roundabout way to get her to stop having this affair. Okay? So okay. That it is possible he did have motive. And then from that point on, he possibly had motive to keep it up um, to, to, as, a, as a way of grinding an ax. He accused Sheriff Radcliffe of covering up Ron's death. The Circleville letter writer accused um, uh, the sheriff of covering up Ron's death. The the um, prosecutor in the case got his own letter. The pro the guy who prosecuted Paul Freshour got his own super scandalous letter. The coroner who ruled it was an accident in Ron Gillespie's death got a super scandalous letter. These people were people that Paul Freshour would have had a problem with, and no one else, it, none of the other suspects would have had a problem with. So it's also apparently there was a letter, um, a handwriting analyst who was on a 2021 episode of 48 Hours, who said, this, these were written by one person, and that person was Paul Freshour, based on his handwriting. Um, and apparently, the um, Whatever Remains podcast turned up, apparently somebody got fingerprints off of some of the letters that were sent while Paul was in prison, and they yeah. had Paul's fingerprints on them. So there's a lot of stuff that incriminates Paul as well. It's entirely possible it was him. And the other, the last thing is, is the moment he got out of prison, um, the right, right around the time he got out of prison, the letters just stopped altogether. Yeah. I don't know that. I don't know what that means, though. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it's up for subjective interpretation. I think it's either multiple people, mainly um, David Longberry and Karen, or it was all Paul. That's my take. Well, I mean, who else could it have been? <laughs> it could have been um, Gordon Massey, obviously. Okay, right. The original guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you got anything else? I got nothing else. Well, if you like this, there's a little bit more to this case, so there's probably a rabbit hole for you to jump down. Go search it on the internet uh, and listen to those other podcasts, Whatever Remains in Invisible Ships, and see what you think about theirs, too. Uh, and since I said that, it's time for Listener Mail. Or get on Reddit, man. Sometimes I'm not on Reddit hardly at all, but sometimes stuff like this is a lot of fun mm -hmm. because you get to see all these different people's takes and opinions. Yeah. Uh, I saw this one guy who literally read the entire 160-something page mm -hmm. thing that Paul had put out in the early 90s. Right. I was like, man, you got more time than I do. Yeah, it's really detailed. I, I was looking through and it is... Yeah, I didn't make it through the whole thing, but if you're if you're into that, go to um, their unresolved mysteries subreddit. It, that That's will right. be up your alley. All right, I'm going to call this uh, Flannan Isles Wave Explained. Yeah, this is uh, this is from Allison from Toronto, but I have to say that we got so many letters that said basically <laughs> the same thing almost immediately after that episode <laughs> came out. <laughs> That I think it's probably what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems pretty possible to me. Mm -hmm. uh, hey guys, love the podcast. You're the best. With regard to Flannan Isles mystery, I'd like to share how I envision it. How about this? The box on the crane's banging around. The two keepers don their weather gear and set off to secure it. The other stays behind from the elevated vantage point of the lighthouse, maybe while skinning the horizon with binoculars. Who knows? 
He spots that rogue wave coming toward the island and in an attempt to warn and save his friends, bolts from the lighthouse without weather gear, maybe even knocks over that chair only to be swept away with his friends in an attempt to save them. One wave, all three gone. I think he saw it coming and thought he had enough time to save them all. That is from Allison from Toronto and many, many other people who said basically the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it sounds pretty good to me. It really does. It's super plausible and it, it didn't... It didn't dawn on me at all that that's a possibility. One wave or One another, wave. it's going to get you. Know, you sometimes when you're sitting here in front of the microphone, you don't have to time to ruminate no. like, like you people do at home. No, the people so want... That's our defense. They want some more jokes. They want some more pithy insights, you know? Yeah, they want another piece of us. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you. I mean, without the rest of everybody, we would be incomplete. So everybody else completes us. Right, Chuck? That's right. That's right. Uh, if you want to send us a uh, an email that completes us, we would appreciate that. You can send it to us at Stuff Podcast. Wait, hold on, Chuck. Who was that that wrote in? Allison from Toronto. Thank you, Allison from Toronto, and everybody else who wrote in too. You can send your email to Stuff Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app. Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.